good evening to everyone and welcome to another Word Up Bible Study. I am so excited, you know, we call this Word Up Bible Study because the reality is the Word of God is the only thing that can keep us safe and keep us on the right path and keep us in the right direction. And we're talking about faith. And I said when I started this, please don't tune out because a lot of times people think that Faith is one of those elementary things. You know, I, I learned that when I got saved. Can I tell you, you will never, ever, ever learn enough about faith. Faith has no limits. It has no top. As, as much as you can believe is as much as God can do it. Faith works with God's timing. It works with our needs. It works with our struggles. But faith is so important. And I will tell you one solid thing. This is that take to the bank thing. And that is without faith, you're not going to make it. Because even people in the world, and you've heard these suggestions already. I want you to start getting people on because we're getting ready to start this lesson. But you've heard this. These are, these are just my introductory remarks. And you, you've heard this. But no matter who you are, you're going to need faith in every instance. And sometimes our faith, the word, biblical word is wanes. That means that sometimes our faith gives out or our faith is not as strong. And one of the reasons our faith gives out and our faith wanes is because we have found ourselves in a position where we're in a struggle and sometimes doubt comes. Let me say this so everyone can understand where we are. And I want you to grab your Bibles, grab your phones, grab your whatever you have, and go to the exciting book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews has been called the Magna Carta of faith. It's the Heroes Hall of Faith. But there's so many intricacies that I want to teach you, some revelations that God will show how you can keep your faith strong. As I said in the first two weeks of this message, is yes, you have faith, and you have all the faith you need. But my question is, do you use all your faith? Do you put it into action? Do you operate in your faith? Do you live by your faith? Christians that mature, watch this, they get to the point where they also live by faith. They put everything else that they live by, that they call strength, goes underneath the faith. So my intelligence, my degrees, my intellect, my feelings, you know, anything else goes under faith because if I'm going to ever get to the point that I grow to my assignment and while I'm doing my assignment also have peace and understanding and live a decent life, it's going to have to be done by faith. Can I explain that again? All of us have an assignment. You have an enemy trying to stop you. You have your flesh getting in the way. And what happens is you want to do your assignment. And the only way you can live and live a real life is to live by faith in God. But I'll tell you this. Another reason this lesson is so important is because I have doubts. I'm making a profession. I grew up in church. I grew up in church and doing Sunday school, singing on the youth choir, youth usher, I did all of that. But when I got older, I wasn't one of the kind that stayed in church. You know, I didn't go to a Christian college. I just sowed my wild oats. I got out there, did what I wanted to do, singing in a band. I did it all. I'll leave that to your imagination. But when I came back to God, which was a short time, right, I came back to the Lord uh, in my early 20s. And when I came back to God, I was hungry for faith because, you know, God has his hands on all of us. You're sitting there right now. You don't understand why your life goes this way and someone else's life goes another way. It's because you haven't figured out that God has his hand on you. And that's the most powerful hand in the world. Yeah, you, you need to understand that. God has his hand on you and he's constantly trying to take his hand and bring you into not only the revelation, but into the manifestation of what he wants your life to be. But anyway. I grew up in church, and I hit the ground running. For long, I was not only a deacon in the church, and then a Sunday school teacher, I was a trustee, I was a minister, I drove a Sunday school bus, I did all of that, but the whole time, I was eating up that word. I was, God, whatever you say, I believe it. And I remember going into the word, so I just tried to exhaust, I just wanted to learn everything, right? With all that, 
I now have been pastoring for 35 years. Watch this. And I still have doubts. I know it's a bad confession, but I want to tell you, there's not a person, I don't care who they are, they can give you all their titles and they can dress in the most elaborate. We all wrestle with doubts. We wrestle with doubts because sometimes our situations grip us at the wrong time. So we have to continue to fight. That's why Apostle Paul said, I fought a good fight. He, 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 he said, I finished my course. Paul was letting you know, man, there were times. You know, we, we read where Paul was thrown into the deep and, you know, left for dead and stoned and all of that. You don't believe there was a moment when he was just wrestling with his faith? He didn't go straight through. And we have, we have documentation in Scripture that tells you that we all have doubts about what God is doing, doubts about can we survive this, doubts about sometimes even, you know, a doubt may cross your mind. Is heaven real? Oh, God forbid. I don't want to listen to this pastor anymore. But sometimes it hits you. Man, it's all this real. And I think, and then all of a sudden, I push that doubt out my mind and I say, when I get to heaven, I know I'm going to see God. I'm going to see glory. Boom, boom, boom. But what I'm telling you is, if you're the kind of person that ignores self-inspection and don't tell the truth about your doubts, about God, what God is doing, where God is, is you'll, where God is right now in your life, you'll never grow in your faith. Understand that. Because it's when we wrestle with something, it's when we have to deal with something to a point that is not only being dealt with on a surface level, but I'm dealing with it deep inside of me. Even Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, when he got into that garden of Gethsemane, he had that one moment when he said, Father, if it's possible, Take this cup away from me. Now, he was God, so he knew it was impossible. But I believe, being in our flesh, he still was teaching and leading us through that moment to let us know, don't worry about your doubts coming. And that's the key to getting faith wrong. You, you can't worry about your doubts. When real faith kicks in, your doubts go away. Uh, you get in church and you pray for something. I'm praying for, you know, I, I, I have a bad financial situation and I'm about to lose my house or I don't have money to do this with my children and you pray and sometimes right in the middle of that prayer a doubt may come that you know that's silly why are you praying but then your faith kicks in because you allow faith to be first place in your life so write this because I'm going on but I'm trying to be honest so you get where I am write down in your chat in your notes if you're doing that I have to move faith first place in my life. And that's what this book of Hebrews is about. I'm not going to recap all of it, but you have to know the book of Hebrews points everything to Jesus Christ, his superiority over the law and Moses, over angels, over sacrifice. This is about the New Testament, the new covenant God gave us, which is a covenant of faith is better than the old covenant, which is a covenant of law and works. And the problem with us having doubt and having faith is sometimes we still look at our law and our works. And what that means is we believe we can work our way back up. But the reality is it's deeper than just working your way back up. It's tightening up your relationship in course, in respect to the word of God. How does how I'm living Reflect in how the word Sam should should be living. And I, am I a believer only when it comes to church or around other believers? Or have I made myself aware of that I have to be a believer in all situations so my faith can grow? And from the very first chapter of Hebrews, we found out it talked about Jesus being better. Now, we're going to land this text hopefully today and going through the book of Hebrews, fire you up. It is so powerful. But I want to take us through each chapter to show how our faith crescendos through these chapters. And then even chapter 12 is powerful. And 13 is powerful because it gives us an ending. But chapter 11 is the one we're going to look at for our faith principles. But right now, let's look right now. We left off with chapter 5. And what we've been doing is going through and reading about uh, 
the key, the key verses in each chapter so that we can be ready to understand our faith. Give me a minute here, I'll get there. Okay, let's put this aside and let's go to the phone. Go to Hebrews chapter 6 with me. In Hebrews chapter 6, we're talking about what each chapter means. It's against falling away. I talked a little bit about that last time, but falling away actually means a reprobate. How if you walk away from the truth that's in Jesus Christ, you become a reprobate or you become damned. Um, because there's no, well, the scripture actually says it's impossible to come back to repentance because it subjects Christ once again to an open shame. Now, I'm going to read um, verses 1 through 6 in chapter 6, follow me. But this chapter settles the issue of whether or not we have eternal security in our faith or whether we, or not doesn't settle it, but one of the verses that people utilize to show that someone can lose their salvation. First, I will just tell you in a very practical sense that we cannot be trusted. Will anybody agree with me on that? We can't be trusted. You think God's going to send his son down to die on the cross, give us a way to salvation, and then still make it so that we can, so that we can get to a point that once we have salvation, we can lose it. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't follow the text. It doesn't follow scripture. The Bible tells us, or, or you're actually condemning all of God's word to be so weak that it can't stand tests. The word can't be tested. How do you know the word on healing can, can work if the word on healing can't be tested? How do you know that salvation, when God says, nothing can pluck you out of my hands, how do you know that doesn't work? Or, or why would God, after having the prophets and after having all the kings and after having all the judges and after having all the patriarchs, which he saw none of that work, that's the reason he sent his son down to us so that there would be a ironclad understanding that our faith leads us into a salvation and we are kept by the power of God. Let's read those verses again. Come on, stay with me. Might not be convinced. We'll talk this a little more. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings. I'm reading this from an NIV version. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings of Toward maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about cleansing rites, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment, and God permitting, we will do so. Remember, I said you must understand the audience that this writer in Hebrews is talking to. So all of these things he had to go through, this litany of things, to get the people he was talking to to understand that this one act of believing in Jesus Christ covers all of these things. You just have to get mature enough to move toward those things that, that, that God covers. So he's saying, but we can't lay, and, and you got to remember, they did not believe in salvation in this dead prophet who now had been risen from the dead uh, by those who were believers. And it said, it's impossible, look at verse 4, for those who have once been enlightened, that doesn't say once saved. The word enlightened means you know about Jesus. Come on, you've been to church. You've heard all the songs, I know it was the blood. And uh, you've heard all the songs, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Or you've heard them sing, we'll understand it better by and by. But we can get into some new stuff. You heard Ty Trivers say, new, new, all things new. You've heard them, you've heard, whoever your favorite singer is, you've heard them singing the promises of the word because he wants you to know that you are enlightened. There's people right now, uh, Ty Trivet and Kurt Franklin, I can name you many artists that are on secular channels and people love those songs, but they don't get saved. They just sound like that music. That don't mean they're saved. They're enlightened to know there's something there. But the sin in their members and their selfishness stop them from yielding to the authority of Christ. And Christ is constantly knocking on the door. I knock on the door. He's knocking on the door waiting for you to let him in. 
Some people just like to be close, just like to be apart, but they never actually become saved. They've tasted of the heavenly gift, who have shared the Holy Spirit. You've been in church and seen people that you shouting. You, you tasted that heavenly gift. That word means that you've seen it. You, you felt that spirit while you were sitting in church. You did not have to be saved to feel that. There's many people who feel that while we're preaching, and you know what they do? They fight back that feeling, and they walk out once again, walking away from, and they've been enlightened. Man, this is good. I need to get more. But they walk away from, and stay away from, because they're scared to, <laughs> to continue looking at God. You know yourself, as bad as you were, I don't know who I'm talking to, but as evil as you were, with the sin you had committed, once that power of God got into your heart, wasn't it something that you never imagined? And all of a sudden, God took you to another place. And now you're walking around secure in him. It's like, I can't totally explain it. But look at verse 4. Because this is what people use sometimes to tell you that you just can lose this power of salvation. That God did not make any preparations or any plans so that he could deal with our times of sin. I believe when we got saved, the Bible says all of our sins were forgiving, past, present, and future. That's why God blesses us. And I believe that if we repent, he says in his word, I am faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. That's how we know this text is not talking about that. This text is talking about it's impossible. For those who have been enlightened, who have tasted that we get, who have shared the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God, and the power of the coming age, who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. He said, once you repent, you've had all this stuff, it's impossible that you were saved and you got repenting. It's, it can't happen because once you're safe in God's arms, you are safe in God's arms. But Jesus Christ is better than a salvation that can be lost, that you can walk away from, He's giving you a salvation of grace. Why do you think the word grace is there first? He overlooks. We like to sing it, but then we get on these, I call them pharisaical terms of, you know, I think we start believing our own press. Like, I'm this holy person. Come on, quit. You know you if nobody else knows you. You know the thoughts you think probably should have gotten you disqualified if there was such a thing. If somebody could lose their salvation just for what you thought, you should have lost yours. Why didn't you lose yours? And don't tell me you repented all the time, because you did not. There's some unconscious things you've done in your life. There's some evil thoughts you had against people, even in the church. And you did not repent of those thoughts. You just kept it moving. And yet you think, all of a sudden, I can lose my salvation. How dare you? How, how arrogant of you to get to the point that you have this key, and there's a few certain of us that have this key that we're not going to lose ours. But there's some people who just choose to walk away. I don't think God does that. I think it goes against everything that is centered in Scripture, the synergy of Scripture. What do I mean by that? Why would God say you can enter into heaven with one hand, one foot, one eye, just get there? God is saying you may do some stuff down here, but I have done enough through my blood to keep you. I paid the price. So now I got saved, and he paid the price, but he remained. He took back the price? Come on, it doesn't make sense. I, I've talked to theologians about this for years, and I told them, I sure, I hope you like arguing this doctrine, but I sure hope you don't believe this doctrine because you don't know where you're going. And I'm fearful for you because you may not make it to heaven because you think you got to keep yourself. Strange place to be. I don't want to be there. I know I can't keep myself. I do not want to be there. Let's look at chapter 7. Chapter 7 is a powerful chapter because it talks about Melchizedek. I think we talked a little bit about this, but it compares Jesus to Melchizedek, a priest forever without lineage. Um, Abraham paid honor and tithes to Melchizedek, and by doing so, Levitical priesthood was blessed by him as Levi was still uh, in, inside of Abraham. So watch this. What this is saying is God gave us a type uh, uh, a symbol, a symbol, or a type of, an art, archetype of what the priesthood would be like. And it talks about Jesus Christ coming in. He is a better high priest. What does that mean? Melchizedek. And, you know, we look at this one, 
and we try to focus in on the ties and the honor, and that's good because it talks about making sure that you understand your part in being a part of the body of Christ is to become a giver. Um, God cherishes giving to the poor. Um, God cherishes givers. He said givers are going to be the ones that's blessed. Um, I, God said the ones I repay are the ones who give. And he's not just talking about money. People have given the church a bad name when I'm talking about money, but it's not about money. It's about understanding that if you can become a giver, you're never going to be without. Because that's what uh, actually the word uh, when you read the text, let me read, let me read a couple of scriptures so you'll see that. Chapter 7, let me read uh, verses 1 till about 5, just so we can see. It said, This Mount Chesedek was the king of Salem. He was the king of Salem and a priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek actually means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem and king of peace. Understand that, look, that's the symbolic connection to Jesus Christ. It means king of righteousness, king of Salem, king of priests. We call Jesus Christ the prince of uh, peace. We call Jesus Christ the one who is the righteousness. He is righteousness. He is our king. You know, he's our salvation and our soon coming king. Jesus fits all of those, but he's saying Jesus is better than Melchizedek because Melchizedek had an end and he had a beginning. Jesus Christ has no end and has no beginning and he has all power. Watch this. Um, without father and mother, talking about uh, Melchizedek, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the son of God, he remains a priest forever. So, this Melchizedek was actually said to be compared to Christ, but he still was not as powerful as Christ because Christ, Christ paid the price for everyone. Watch this. The scripture tells us in verse 4, just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. That, that wasn't for us. That was for the Hebrews. You know, the Hebrews held Father Abraham in high esteem. He's, he's convinced, he's put this argument together to convince um, the Hebrews that they need to understand how powerful Jesus is. And he said, think about it. If, if Jesus wasn't better, right? He said, Abraham paid homage to Melchizedek. And Jesus is that type of Melchizedek. So Jesus is better. It said, this man, however, and this is what you need to understand. This man, however, verse 6, did not trace his descent from Levi, Yet he collected a tent from Abraham and blessed him who had the promise. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. Without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. So we need to understand that Jesus is greater as our soon coming king. Jesus is greater than Melchizedek. And he's greater than anyone else we can give to. If you give service to Jesus, the payback is out of this world. Right? So Hebrews 8, come on, we're pushing toward 11, seeing where we, we see the faith of all the faith heroes. In Hebrews 8, chapter 8 shows us that Jesus is the mediator of a new and better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. Jesus is ministering in the heavenly tabernacle at the right hand of God, not the earthly one. I like this, which was just a copy or shadow of the things to come. So Hebrews 8 walks us through God's chosen people and what they had to do, and we're going to get to the sacrifices in Hebrew 9, to actually keep their relationship with God. They had to keep the law. And when not, they had to have a priest that would give sacrifices for them. But we found out that Jesus is a more excellent way. Let's go to verse 6 and read down to verse 10. Look at your Bibles and read with me. I'm doing King James this time. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Why were the promises of this covenant better? Because the other covenant were established upon your ability to keep the law, which we couldn't do, to give sacrifices, which we didn't do always, and this covenant is based upon the promise that if you receive Jesus Christ into your heart, 
Take him as your savior. And if you walk with him and you learn his word, the Bible says all the promises in him are yes and amen. So the better covenant is I now have the protection of Jesus Christ more so than just the protections of my actions and my thoughts. Look at verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no other place have sought. Verse 7. If God had already had the best covenant, why did he make another one? God doesn't make mistakes. God follows a plan. That's why we can rely on God. You can't expect a break in what God does. You don't have to worry about a failure coming from God. God had a plan, and he had a plan within that plan because God always knows what he wants to plan. Can I get an amen? God knows that this plan is in place. There's a plan in place to keep us, to bless us. There's a plan in place once Adam and Eve messed up for this whole covenant to come through. There's a plan in place that God called his people and knew even those he called were at times going to be unfaithful. Moses, kicking the rock or hitting the rock. David, I can take you through. We all make mistakes. But God said this covenant now is better. It's not based upon a faultless person. I mean, a person who can have faults and themselves be messed up. It's based upon Jesus Christ, who himself took on our form without sin in his flesh, took us in his heart and said, I will die in their place. I'm getting chills. I don't know about you. I will die in your place. God, you'll die in my place. He'll die with all the worthless stuff I did. Jesus Christ said, come here. I'll pay that price. I'll die. And God said, well, if you do, watch this. Every promise that is Pray to you, that's asked of you. Everything that they ask in your name, I'm going to do because this is a better covenant because you went straight through perfectly to establish this covenant. That plan of redemption covenant, you came through and established it perfectly. I love that. Look, verse 8 says, For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is a covenant that I will make, watch this, with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. I will write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Look at what God did not leave to chance. We now have the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, living in our bodies. God said, I'm going to write my laws in their mind, and I'm going to put my spirit in their heart. When you're connected to God, there's a spiritual connection, and somebody here knows that. It's like your conscience will let you know I'm doing something against God right now and I need to quit, <laughs> right? Your conscience will tell I come on, have you, that's why I started off saying I have doubts. There's times my conscience said, well, remember who you are. <clears throat> remember who you're representing. Remember how you're supposed to act. That's when you know there's something on the inside working on the outside, bringing me back into captivity of my relationship with God. Man, if there was not, we would have done more sin. We'd have sinned longer. We'd have messed up longer. How many be honest in here and know that that conscience pricked your heart so much till you got to the point where you just saw the ugliness of your own sin. You saw the weakness in your flesh saying, why am I so weak when I have a Savior who brought me this far? Why don't I believe that God can heal now when I know he healed me 10 years ago? Why don't I believe that God's going to pay this bill like he paid the other bills? You know what it is? It's because when we get to a point, we struggle. But thank God he's got the Holy Spirit inside of us that makes us come back around. And what does it is, getting that word that's in your mind. Bring it back. So it doesn't look like it, it's impossible for me to find the money by Friday to keep my house together. But somehow, the money comes in or God changes the heart or slows down the mail or, or, 
or they can't do it now. I don't know why. I just know by faith. Anybody with me? God has taken me far. Can somebody say by faith? God has brought some things to pass in my life by faith. By my faith, little as it was, God has proven who he is. And that's because God has built with us a better covenant. Let's go to chapter 9. I'm not going to make it to 11, even today, even tonight, man. It's something. Hebrews 9. Now, this is a good contrast of the Old and the New Testament. Now, the reason, again, I told you you had to go through this and why we're looking at it, so we can understand what the, the scaffolding that's upholding our, our blessing. Hebrews 9 shows how worship in the Old Testament could not perfect the worshiper because it related, watch this, only to food, to drink, to washings and regulations for the body. Did you get that? It could only touch the body. When I got done, that's what that did for me. It got me back. My body was cleansed. However, when Christ appeared, he entered the heavenly tabernacle and poured out his own blood on the mercy seat. I don't have to go into a the detailed explanation of the tabernacle in the wilderness. You just need to know the essentials was there was the outer court of the Gentiles, there was the inner court, and then there was the Holy of Holies. And only the priests could go in there. In the Holy of Holies was the mercy seat. And so a priest would then give order or sacrifice for whatever sin the people created. Let's look at uh, verses 11 through 14 in chapter 9. Go there with me, chapter 9. You there? Chapter 9. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, this is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place. You know, the priest had to go year after year, right? having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer sprinkled on the unclean, sanctified to the purity of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without a spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So this new, um, when we read the scripture, in John chapter 6, Jesus says, my words are spirit, and my words are life. Jesus came, died on the cross for us. He became the word of God. He, he, you know, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was the word. Every act Jesus did placed power in the word of God, right? So when you read a scripture, when you go to the hospital and somebody's sick, I've had this happen many times, and I read a scripture over them and pray. I read the scripture first, which sets a foundation or sets them a direction to show that the word has power. And then I back up that scripture through my prayer. My prayer then brings that scripture to life in them. And I tell them when I leave, read the scripture just like you would taking your medication. Read this three times a day. And sometimes I find people are... They get, they get drawn to one scripture, I tell them, that's the Holy Spirit pushing you toward that scripture. That's the one you need. Uh, I have a favorite scripture at a certain time, but then there's other times a scripture will jump out at me and I can't help but read it over and over again and say, where has this power been all my life? And I read it and God blesses you through the word of God. This text says, how much more is he better than the blood of bulls and of goats and of lambs? Because Jesus Christ goes in and purges our conscience, our soul, right? You know, with spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, God's spirit lives in our heart. Um, we also have our body, right? Which we'll get a new body when we get to heaven. But we also have a soul which is made up of our thought life and uh, made up of our mind and it's made up of our emotions and God's word can come in and calm those emotions. Um, you know, I, I was going in, I was in the hospital after surgery and I remember uh, I hadn't heard from the doctor yet how my surgery had gone. They got me out. I, I mean, I made it through. That's a good sign. 
But I was laying there waiting on the doctor to come and give me that report to say everything was okay. And while I was laying there, my emotions were up and down. The nurse came in to take my blood pressure and said, uh, Mr. Duncan, your pressure is a little high. I said, I know I got a lot on my mind. I said, you know what, just leave. Uh, come back in about a half hour, I'll be fine. Well, I was gonna open my Bible, read some scriptures, and put my mind on scriptures, and I knew that that would bring me to a place of calmness. I was gonna recharge my faith. And the doctor came in. He said, oh, yeah, everything worked, 100%, great job, you're gonna be home in no time. I said, everything? He said, yep, we got everything, everything's good. Let me tell you something. I then went into scriptures of gratitude. Are you with me? Not scriptures of building my faith. I just was thanking God that he did what he said he was going to do. Came back in to take my blood pressure, and I was fine. Why am I telling you this? Because there's a spirit in us by the word of God that can take us through the most dangerous and disastrous situations. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Because of the power in God's word and that power was placed in by Christ. Let me, let me go aside and tell somebody, listen to me, I don't want this just to be a, a rote teaching. I want you to understand something. As I'm talking, apply this to your life. Everybody's got a situation. I got one right now while I'm talking. Here I have a situation right now that I turned over to God while I'm doing this text. You know why I turned it over to God? Because I'm still wrestling with it. And I know God's going to do what he said. I don't know when. That's part of our faith. Our faith says you can't tell God when. We just got to know that what God is doing is better than what we are doing. Amen? So I need you to apply it. If, if I could, I, I, I'm not going to stop because we're almost at the end of our teaching. But you need to, right now, as you hear this word coming forth, stop right now and say, I'm taking that. That's for me. You got to start claiming these promises so that you can now increase your own faith. I'm telling you foundational principles that should make you say, wow, my Bible is true. Wow, my faith is powerful. Wow, Jesus Christ has done a lot for me. That's when you know you're standing on the word of God. Because we as human beings are going to face some dark, ugly, doubtful times. And no other preacher told you, even when we preach, when I'm putting together a message, Sometimes my heart is so pricked and stepped on by what God is telling me to preach that I have to repent as I'm putting it together. Or sometimes I'm so refreshed that I get so excited I can't wait to preach it because it's just reminding me of some things that I need. Let's go to 10. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 shows that the law was never able to make those who draw near because of its shadow a reality. So, um... The priest could tell me, you know, I give my, my offering. I'm okay now as far as the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests are concerned. But am I? In my heart, I'm still the same old evil person. I mean, I go home and I still might, after I sacrifice my goat or my bull, I may go home and beat my wife. After I get done doing what I'm doing, I may go home and slap around my kids. I may go and try to steal something. What I'm saying is, this kind of forgiveness, this kind of law was only a shadow. It could not really change me. But the Bible said if any man is in Christ, he becomes a new creation. He had to give us something that's called once and for all salvation. Let's go to 10. We'll just read a few verses starting at verse 6 of chapter 10. In burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin... Thou hast had no pleasure. Wait a minute, God. You instituted the burnt offerings for sin, but you have no pleasure in them? God is saying, no, I had no pleasure because most of the time, the people did not keep what they said they were going to do. But then God said, lo, I come, Jesus Christ, in the volume of the book, as it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had pleasure uh, in therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Freedom. Everybody's free. Jesus came. He took away the condemnation of my thoughts. 
the condemnation of my actions. Once I received him as my savior, he took away this empty feeling that says, now I'm still subject to a punishment. No, he said, I paid the price. When you repent, when you keep your relationship lined up with me, then you have full benefit of everything I'm doing. You know, once you learn the fact that Jesus paid it all, and you heard the hymn song, and we say it constantly, but you got to start saying all how it affects you this morning. Whatever you're going through this evening, it, he paid it all. He paid it all. How much did he pay? He paid it all. Jesus Christ, paid, what did he pay? He paid for the pain I'm dealing with now. He paid for the illness in my flesh. He paid for those moments when my thinking is overwhelmed and mentally and emotionally, I'm in a bad spot mentally, uh, health-wise. You know, you can be in great shape physically in a bad spot mentally, or you can be in great shape mentally in a bad spot physically, and the balance that keeps us in all of those times, I know i got to witness, is the power of God. It's the fact that Jesus paid for sin. I want you to look at this. Verse 11 says, and Every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifice, which he can never take away sins. Sometimes I got to go back for the same sacrifice. I keep doing the same sins because it never took it away. But this man, talking about Jesus, chapter 12, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. Set up. Somebody say it's set up. It's set up. The promises of God will work. It's set up. I'm not going under. It's set up. If I hold on to Jesus, nothing is impossible. It's settled that his word can handle anything I go through. It's settled. Jesus Christ paid the price. So now I can have the blessing that takes us to chapter 11. We're not going to go through that one. But just let me say this to you. This chapter after all of that is a demonstration of this wonderful power of faith shown through the lives of normal everyday patriarchs, we see all of them. We see their failures and their flaws and the things messed up, but we still see that this power, which cannot be taken away, is still applicable. They can still use it. Moses, after murder, can still be used of God. David, we go through this text. Abraham, we go through this text. It's showing us that this hall of fame of faith or this faith hall of fame is showing us that God uses ordinary people. I wish there was somebody who would testify that they know that God has moved in your life by faith and you didn't even understand why God did it in the state you were in. But it's because God loves you. Sometimes I like to make bring people back. Especially those folk who have this cynical, I call it a cynical spirit when um, the only way you can preach to people is to scare them out of their shoes about the fact that you have it and they don't. No. You, you've got to be honest with people. you got to be transparent with people. You know, uh, my young people need to know, wow, Pastor, you've been preaching all this time. You still have doubts? Yup. What do you think that would do for a young person when they hear me say that I have to wrestle to bring my faith? They'll wrestle to bring their faith. What do you think it'll do when I see a man and, and a man is honest with another man and say, yeah, I got to, I got to struggle to make sure I don't fornicate. Yeah, but you know so much about God. You know his word. I got to make sure that I don't. No, this is in our humanity. In our humanity, God has done this awesome thing and it tells us that he's put this treasure in earthen vessels. <laughs> this treasure is his spirit that we can fight through anything that's going on. On. Well, I got to hurry because I want to make sure next week we can start on 11. So go to 12. Go to the chapter 12. Chapter 12 is one of those chapters that sticks in our memory. We're going to go back to 11, right? And we're going to look at each one of those uh, faith patriarchs, and they're going to give us the principles that we can handle our faith. But chapter 12 is a call to what I was just talking about, perseverance. Faith is not some magical Thing that falls out of the sky. It's ours, but we put ourselves 
in certain positions to receive it, right? Um, I had a bedroom in my mother and father's house. And in that bedroom, my bedroom were my things and my bed. But in order for me to receive things from my parents, they had curfews and they had house chores. I know that's an awful word, so let me bring it down for this generation. I had to do some cleaning before I could get anything else. My mother, I, I get up and I need my lunch money and I play sports when I was in school so I needed extra money. Afterward, the bus goes stop to McDonald's. Can you give me a couple of books? And I had to get all that, but my mom said, listen to this, but what does this have to do with McDonald's? My mom would say, is your bed made? Is your room clean? Mom, I live in this house. I'm your child. This, I, I know you're supposed to take care of me. Just give me. But there were conditions. There were rules to be getting what was already mine. And that's what 12 does. It reminds us that we have to, there's an hour part to getting these powerful blessings of God. Look at it. Wherefore, 12 verse 1, seeing we are also compass about, we just left 11, so now he's saying we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin, which though easily beset us, let us run with patience the race that is before us. He's given us the understanding or the metaphor that our life is a race. If anybody ever ran track, racing is good going across the finish line, but in the middle of a 400 race, hitting that third curve, looks like you don't have enough to take it to the home stretch. Racing is persevering no matter who you are, even in shape athletes. You'll see them running in Olympics. They'll fall down at the finish line. They gave everything they had. Because in reality, to be a winner, you have to race with perseverance. Somebody just put that in the chat right now. Just say, I will persevere. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the Father. For consider him, who endured, such, who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your mind. You have not resisted unto blood. God is saying, when you get to the point that you're so weary, remember your Savior. Um, he endured not only the scribes and Pharisees, religious leaders against him, sometimes his own people, Mary and Martha, didn't believe him. He had to weep. Then his disciples, on the day he was dying, they all ran away and scattered. And yet, he went down and had to fight through hell. He endured going from hall to hall, getting slapped and beaten. And then, the, of course, we understand the torture of his beating when they were finally saying, crucify him. He endured all of that and still had nerve to say, Father, forgive them. The, the, the most powerful thing I think Jesus said across to me was, it is finished, and into thy hands I commend my spirit. When he said it's finished, it means he gave everything until the manifestation comes. You gotta get to a point where when you're in a trial, you say, I'm not leaving this trial until I know that it is finished. And that's what this is about. It's about understanding that you're in a, you got faith, the blessing is yours, but in order to get it, you got to lay aside every weight and sin. And then finally, chapter 13, as we get ready to close this session, go to 13. Hebrews 13 is a mixture of warnings, requests, and final exhortations. It is a reminder for us to fellowship, to let love remain, to show hospitality to each other, and remembering um, to pray for the leaders. This is like the culminating way we should live when we have faith. It, it ends on a wonderful note of saying Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let me read verse 5 of this. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he that said, I will never leave thee, 
nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Man, keep reading that chapter. The exhortations are there. There's also the warnings about not acting as the Hebrews acted because we have this better covenant. And so when you read this, you're going to find out next week when we go into it, you're going to see the principles of what sustained each one of these people, how they lived out their faith. God bless you. This is Pastor Duncan saying, keep the word up. Keep that word first place. Don't forget, Sunday morning, come and join us for worship service if you have not. Um, if you've been listening to this ministry and you want to give to this ministry, um, go to our website, www.shilohbaptistchurches. Uh, when you go on, on Facebook or Instagram, we go under the hashtag of SBC Praise Church. And when you do this, you can give unto this ministry electronically. Write us a prayer request. Go online. There's a space on our website, and we will answer your prayer request. You can actually become a member of this church. On Sunday morning, we have one church in two locations. 9.30 in Violet, New Jersey, and then 11.30 here in Port Norris. We have two powerful services. You cannot go wrong. Just make sure you do that. Send in. If this ministry is blessing you, just send in an offering. And we'll make sure that you see how to do that. The information is on the screen for you to send a blessing to the offering, to this ministry. And God bless you. And remember, live by faith. Use your faith and keep the word up. Mm -hmm.